and we're recording. Okie dokie, so we'll get started. So um, as I mentioned when we first started, um, this, the purpose of this is to try to clarify um, the reason for asking some of the questions that we're asking in this year's uh, re propagation permit renewal application and also on the annual report form and basically just back up the, the statutory and regulatory authority that you know, allows us to ask those questions. Um, so we've been fielding a lot of questions ourselves. We've gotten a lot of phone calls um, just for some guidance on how to answer the questions. And Scott has also um, from a lot of the Mass Aquaculture Association uh, members. So um, we're going to go through some of these uh, questions that I think a lot of you um, may you know, have came, come on to ask, and then um, we'll open it to uh, questions that we didn't cover at the end. Most of the questions, um, the additional questions on the application and report form came up, came about due to um, issues we had during the COVID-19 uh, CARES Relief Program. Um, as you know, we had um, different sectors so if you were a grower and also a wild harvester, and some of them were even a dealer, then you qualified in different sectors. And um, we needed to make sure that the, um, the value of those different sectors were appropriately allotted. So some of these extra questions came about due to trying to tease out those differences. Um, some of these are just basic DMF reporting requirements that we've refined. And um, others are due to changes in the National Shellfish Sanitation Program requirements. So um, the National Shellfish Sanitation Program um, basically is the, the framework that administers um, the regulations that are voted on at the ISSC, the Interstate Shellfish Sanitation Conference. And um, the conference happens every two years and uh, 2019 was the last one. So the new um, guide for the control of molluscan shellfish that was um, voted on and refined at the 2019 conference was just published in October 29th of this year. Okay. So there was some question about um, you know, what's the authority? Where do we get the authority to ask the question? So this is a very busy slide that basically conveys, you know, where the authority comes from. You know, we have uh, chapter 130 is the, the basic law that, that governs marine fisheries and section 17B uh, talks about aquacultural enterprises and their permits. And it says that, you know, under such terms and conditions as the director may impose so a lot of the, um, the questions we have on the aquaculture renewal application is relative to section B. That's where that authority comes from. In addition, section 21, compilation of statistics, he may require for such purposes, statistical reporting from all fishermen, wholesale and retail fish dealers and fish processors on such forms and at such time as may be determined. Um, I'm not gonna read through all these, but it basically lets you know if you want to look them up, sections 17B, 21, and 80. Um, 80, the director shall promulgate, promulgate rules and regulations relative to the form, contents, and use of all permits under this chapter. Um, in terms of the regulatory, uh, regulatory authority, we have um, 322 CMR, and so section seven and 15, management of marine aquaculture. So again, I won't go through all of these, but um, you know, the reporting gives some very um, clear items that need to be reported. Uh, and, and we've have asked for some additional information. The, the issue that I think a lot of people are, are grappling with right now is how to respond to the, the new request for operational plans for birds. So the new NSSP guide, we also call it the model ordinance. It's new, um, it's new version in chapter six, shellfish aquaculture requires that any aquaculture operation that can attract birds and mammals. Right now, we're kind of um, 
keeping it to floating gear. We, we feel that you know the other types are less likely, but floating gear, we, we all observe the birds on the floating gear. Um, so an operational plan is required. And you know, this describes the different items that is re are required in the operational plan, a description and design, a description of the design and activities, um, the specific site boundaries, the shellfish to be cultured. Um, basically, you know, what is your plan to deter the birds? So um, we figured instead of saying, okay, you have to give us a operation plan, we kind of put a section in the application so that there were very directed questions. And this can serve as your um, operation plan because other parts of the application already have a description of your gear. We already have the location of your site. So instead of you having to draft that as a separate document, this it, it seemed easier for you and us to just put it as, as part of the application. So in the application, um, you'll see, this is basically what you see. Do you, do you utilize floating gear for shellfish aquaculture? Yes or no? Um, if it's no, well, then you don't have to worry about answering, you know, going on to part E. If you do, then um, we're asking you to try something. If not one of these, um, you know, things that we're giving you the opportunity to check, you want to be creative and, you know, describe it in other. But um, the, the FDA and the, the model ordinance requires that you try something. And, you know, we're supposed to be doing annual site visits and we would be evaluating whether your bird deterrent deterrence plans are, um, are effective. And you know, if we see that they're not effective, then you need to try something else. Um, another thing that's um, that's relatively new in the model ordinance um, is that floating gear is considered a pollution source to the water body now. And as such, um, we're supposed to have classification monitoring stations, so water quality monitoring stations right at the pollution source. Um, so again, if, if there are birds all over floating gear and we start sampling right on the gear, there's a good chance that the water body is going to get shut down. So, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to have to grapple with that. So we can try to try our best to try to deter the birds and um, get to a place where, um, you know, you and your neighbor have been somewhat successful and, you know, just having the plan that you're trying something you know, allows us to be in conformance right now with the model ordinance. So again, if we go out there for a site visit or if um, our classification biologists are out there in normal water quality sampling and they're, they're seeing the birds all the time, you know, you'll probably be asked, you're gonna have to try another technique. This just isn't working. Okay, um, another issue that we're having is with um, the request for information regarding your ice machine. So if you buy ice and from uh, you know, a commercial entity, they presumably have already been licensed, they're, they're getting inspected by DPH. But if you make your own ice at home, um, we're, we're required to make sure that the uh, water source is a potable water source that is compliant with drink, uh, uh, safe drinking water standards. Um, and, you know, I had a, a member, a, a grower ask me, well, you know, why is it that I can give it to my grandchild, but and nobody cares if I'm testing it, but I have to, you know, go get tests if I have to put it on an oyster, which is a very good question, but, you know, this is what we have to do. So um, because of, um, the, the regulation and because of the mandates in the model ordinance. So initially uh, the model ordinance was what um, drove our, our regulations. Um, they're not as explicit in the model ordinance anymore, but they are in regulation now where, um, you know, you need to show us if, if, you, if you have well water, you need to get your water tested at least every six months and show us the test results. Um, if you have, um, Municipal drinking water, they're already supposed to um, comply with testing and drinking water standards, so you should be good to go. Um, and then we're just basically looking for you to verify that you're meeting the standards um, in 1604, so the sanitary harvest, handling, and transportation of market brown shellfish. Um, we also put in the report section 
a a little table to serve as your log. You know, so if you can keep track of when you're cleaning your machine and then just fill it in for us at the end of the year, then you know that checks a box. We we're, you know, you're saying you're testifying essentially that you have maintained the machine uh, to safe and sanitary standards. Okay, so part G was a little confusing for some people um, and I can kind of see why. So with the, with the questions we've been fielding, um, I've been taking notes because uh, we can certainly make things more clear and I can see how there can be some confusion in some of these cases. Um, so part G was kind of like a mishmash of some additional information that we're acquiring. Um, they're not necessarily connected. And there was some confusion with that question. Do you harvest wild shellfish from public beds for commercial purposes? So this question was one that was specifically put there as a result of um, the CARES Act administration. Uh, in some areas, it's clear, you know, if, if there's they're selling oysters, if a grower has oysters um, reported, it's from their site, it's cultured product. But there are some areas like Wellfleet where they have a robust wild oyster industry and some do both. So, um, it would make our lives much easier if we had another database to check that. So if you say, I don't wild harvest any of these products, when we QC the, um, the data, so we have both your data, the harvester data, and we also have the dealer data. And for the CARES Act, we use the dealer data because the dealers had a value associated with it. So harvesters aren't required to report value, the dealers are. And because the CARES Act um, dispersed the money proportional to the, the value of your business, um, we needed to know the value of your landings. So all this is giving us is sort of a cross check. If you say, I don't wild harvest anything, then we can, um, we can more easily QC, uh, quality control the, the landings data. Um, there was some confusion. They thought, some people thought that this question was asking if you take product from the wild and put it on your site. That's not what we're asking here. And um, next year we'll refine the language to make it very clear that that's not what we're asking here. So apologies if there was, um, uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't as clear. And one of the reasons why there was some confusion is because right under that question, we're asking if you resubmerge market sized shellfish. So you can kind of see where they might where you might think that um, that question is asking if you're taking wild product and putting it on your site. So again, that the you know, do you harvest wild shellfish? Is do you, you know, are you um, do you harvest in the wild and take it straight to um, straight to a dealer? Uh, just check all of the species that are wild har harvested. Um, do you resubmerge market-sized shellfish during the VP control season? Um, so again, we'll refine this language for next year um, so that it's clear that we're talking about um, your resubmerging product that maybe you offsite culled, you've had out of the water longer than two hours or one hour if you're in one of the areas that require, you know, a one hour time temperature control. Um, so we're, you're required to have a submergence plan, resubmergence plan. And what we're asking here is what's your method of resubmergence? How do you segregate the product and how do you keep record of what's been segregated. For example, if you if you offsite call on a Monday and that product has to be resubmerged for 10 days and then you call again on a Thursday and you now have another lot that has you know a brand new 10 day time clock. How are you um, keeping record on which segregated lot is which and so that you can control for that, those 10 days and making sure that no product is being prematurely harvested. And then um, new this year also is um, we're asking you to name employees. We're going to have on your actual permit any employees who will be moving product off your site um, that and not in your presence. So I know there are some businesses where, especially in the summer when you know students are out of school and there are tourists around that want to just check things out, um, you know, there can be 
the um, different volunteers that are, are you know, somewhat transient, we don't have to worry about those individuals being named on your permit. We're assuming that if you trust somebody enough to be taking your product off your site and without your, you being present, that um, that's a pretty stable employee. So we would like those employees to be named and put on, um, you know, put on your actual permit. This way, if an environmental police officer stops that person, they can see a permit and see, yes, this person, you know, should, you know, has the right to have this undersized product or, you know, if it's off to, you know, over winter or, um, or if it's, you know, offsite culling, it's, it's, it's sort of a check on that. Um, you still should uh, be giving your shellfish constables the list of all employees um, working on your sites at, you know, at some point. They, even if they're not taking product off, if, if, even if you have somebody just for a month, you should be communicating that to your um, shellfish constable. Okay, and then um, I think this is the last slide. Uh, we had asked the question, um, what COVID-19 pandemic relief assistance programs did, were you able to participate in? Um, this is really for our benefit. Uh, we have a, about 400 permitted uh, growers and we gave checks to about a little over 170 people. So that's a substantial fraction of the, the, the aquaculture industry that didn't get relief from the CARES Act package. And speaking to a lot of the growers when we were um, taking calls, trying to uh, help people with their application packages, I spoke with a lot of you who couldn't get help from most of these um, programs, especially newer growers. You know, if you had just became a grower in the last year and a half, two years, and you don't have a history, 2020 was the year you had market sized product to bring to market. Um, most of these programs didn't help you. And this will help us gauge like what fraction of our industry was able to get help. Um, one of the, um, one of the questions I had, and again, do we just just check the boxes? I know that you know some of these these things we could find out by doing some sleuthing, but it'll take you 20 seconds to go through and just check all the boxes for the programs you participated in, um, and it really will be beneficial because it'll give us some information so that if we have another situation like this, we have actual data. Um, that's easily accessible to show, okay, you know, this fraction of our industry was severely impacted, but only this fraction of our industry was able to actually get some assistance. So it really will be helpful for, to, for you to just check the boxes. And um, another thing I noticed um, in some of the calls was um, not all growers knew what these program acronyms were. So I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, my cursor, but um, you know, this one is Woods Hole Sea Grant Cape Cod Cooperative Extension. So there were two programs funded by Woods Hole Sea Grant. One was um, where towns uh, received funds to buy product from their growers and put it out on public beds, whether, I believe they were all recreational. Um, and there was also the shucked market. So. Um, those again were Woods Hole Sea Grant. It became clear that um, some of the growers knew they were, didn't, didn't exactly know what program they were participating in. Uh, there was also the TNC Pew SOAR program, which um, pur uh, purchased oysters from growers around the Buzzards Bay area for restoration planting. Um, one of the questions, or one of the tables in the, um, the annual report form has um, asks if you, you know, how many oysters did you uh, uh, sell for restoration planting? Um, that's another thing I should have added, restoration or municipal public bed planting. So if you uh, sold to your town and they put it in a public recreational bed, that would be reported in that, that section also. Okay, and with that, I think we'll open it up to questions. 
Okay, so at this time, I would ask um, any attendees who have questions, just again, um, there's a participants button at the bottom in the toolbar. If you click on that, it'll open up the participants box and you can raise your hand that way. Um, I see Scott Soares. Scott, you can unmute yourself. Thank, thanks, Julia. And uh, thanks thanks for the presentation, Christy. Just to curious if you can uh, uh, let everyone know uh, how much of the information that's asked for on the forms that were sent out is required uh, for as a condition of getting a license and a permit renewed versus voluntary? Well, really, and anything that we've asked on that, um, on those forms are within our authority to ask and condition, condition the permit on. Um, Generally, if you know, if it doesn't apply or if there are mistakes, you know, we're going to call. We'll call and ask for that information. But we're we're looking for all of this information. All if it's not relevant to you, obviously you're not going to fill out certain questions, but we're looking for all of the information. Okay, thanks. And follow follow up to those those th that question. Uh, will all of this information be protected from a free information request uh, uh, that might may come in, or is it not protected? Um, I do believe it, it goes under the same rules. Um, Jared, Chrissy, I can take that here. if you like. Yep. Hi, everybody. Jared Silva, Mass DMF. I work as the uh, agency's uh, policy analyst and a regulatory program coordinator. And in that, I handle a lot of the public records requests coming into the agency. So there are a number of exemptions to the... Um, to the public records law, um, that includes any data provided under section 21 of chapter 130, which is any of your um, statistical reporting data, your harvest data, or your seed purchases, or your seed planting information. Uh, other information that may be exempt may fall under uh, personal information which we would hold anything dealing with individual incomes. Um, the subsidy payment information itself, I believe is not um, exempt under the um, public records law. So any information you provide to us for the CARES Act that isn't um, personal and date of birth, um, income, um, social security number, anything like that uh, would not be held confidential. Scott, does that answer your question? Uh, not exactly clearly, Jared. I, I was curious just on all of the questions that were asked uh, of the questions, and I'm looking at the COVID one in particular at the end there when you're asking, you know, what relief folks received. As I understand it, that information is likely already available uh, that out there, but uh, now you're asking folks to report it anyway. Yeah, specific to that, I believe that that would not be exempt under the state's public record law. Okay. And you are correct that I also believe that that information would also be available through other sources. Okay, and uh, also related to that, I'm curious on the agencies collecting it, it was pretty shocking that you, only 170, I think, if I remember the number correct that Chrissy cited, actually got relief through CARES, uh, that that's uh, less than half by way of the, the permits that my, my reckoning on what, what's issued. So I'm curious if by the agency asking this question, is it the intention of the division to go back to the administration or to legislators to you know uh, try to access more relief for those growers that kind of slipped through the cracks because the program wasn't uh, designed to really provide them support, or and ultimately how 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 is the division what's the division going to do with this information? But you're exactly right in that if if we have the opportunity for additional funds, we can petition for some differences. For example, the new growers. You know, this 35% loss, having to have a history made, you know, quite a few of the new newcomers, you know, kind of slip through the cracks. So these inform, you know, these check boxes, I, I, I know you're saying it's available, but imagine the amount of man time it takes for us to contact Department of Ag, you know, the, you know, all the different agencies that administered all these different for every individual grower for something that'll take about 20 seconds. 
Um, this, I know it, it could be, you know, especially when we made you um, for the CARES Act, you know, sign a, an affidavit saying, I'm not gonna be made more than a whole. I can understand there may be suspicion thinking, oh, they're trying to catch me getting more money, you know, than maybe I should have gotten. That's not it because from what we've seen, the losses you had are not really coming close to making you more than whole. So that really isn't the intent of this question. It, it really is so that we have some data to show what fraction of the community, of the industry, was able to participate in these programs. Um, from what we've seen, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people fell through the cracks. And we, you know, this would be verifiable data to confirm that. I appreciate that, Chrissy. So, so uh, just to be clear, it, does the agency intend to use this information to help get at additional resources or only if an opportunity presents itself? I mean, are you going to actively use the data to pursue more relief? What's or... Scott, let me answer that. This is uh, Jeff Kennedy. Um, I, Chrissy and I have had a number of conversations about this and uh, just the need to, to try to expand the uh, the pool of, of successful applicants here, you know, uh, recipients. If there's any way that we can we can tweak our 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 program to still comply with the requirements that NOAA has has published, um, uh, we'll use this information to to you know to to bolster that that argument. Um, so yeah, it's we we would like to see more uh, more individuals covered, and if there's any way we can do that, uh, and if this if you know, I can imagine this will will be in our uh, part of our argument. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Chrissy. Okay. Um, next up in the queue is Peter. Peter, you can unmute yourself. Hey, Chrissy. It's uh, Pete Orca. Hi, Pete. How you doing? Hanging in there. So I had a quick question about the uh, the birds on the bags, and the question is um, about what neighbors are doing. So if one person's trying and gets the birds off the bags, but the other people in the area aren't paying attention and bothering to do anything, uh, is it possible to um, and the, the site comes back hot. Is it possible to ask those people just to drop their their bags down onto the bottom so they figure out what's up? So we would we would certainly if if their bird deterrence method isn't being affected we effective we would absolutely tell them they have to do something else. Whether it would be you have to drop your bags that's unclear at this time. Um, but they would have to try something that would be more effective. Um, and it makes more sense. So, so if you found something that was being effective right next door to them, um, it, you know, it seems common sense that they would want to do the same thing, especially if we're getting hot samples and it's going to affect their business. Um, in terms of uh, whether if they refuse, are we going to make them drop that? I think, you know, Jeff, jump in here if you yeah. want to. Yeah, at this point, uh, you know, I think it is a it is a switch. Either there are, there are birds on it or or there are not, and uh, I think we would we would ask them. We would tell them they have to do something different. Um, so there's 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 probably just a handful of solutions, and whether that's uh, uh, um, whether it's putting some kind of uh, bird deterrent on the floating gear or whether it's uh, um, submerging the floating gear, uh, I'm not sure. We don't have any data on in this, and uh, um, you know I think this first year will be a, a learning process for us, as it will for you. Um, and and this is not going to be a, a nice um, a, a nice response, but it, it's just the nature of of this is uh, the state and the federal government and that the the governments they, we regulate. Uh, we're we're not innovating, and it's 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 the growers who are innovating here. So you guys have the the good ideas, and uh, we're going to follow your lead. So if if you have something that's successful and working, um, and and your neighbor doesn't, 
uh, we're certainly going to uh, uh, push those individuals in that direction. Um, and it, it, and I would say that uh, if you have a, a hot spot, if if the, the counts come back high, and there's 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 birds, uh, waterfowl on 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 your neighbor's gear, um, it's going to behoove them to to get the best solution because they want to have their area reopened. They don't want to. Uh, they don't want to be shut down. So um, uh, I would think eventually we'll, we'll, we'll have some recommended best management practices here, but uh, you know, we're, we haven't even, uh, haven't even had one, one year of this. So um, right. we're, we're not about to dictate to you. Right now we're at a point where um, we're allowing just about anything you want to try right now. If, you know, after this year we see pretty much everybody who's trying zip ties across different types of, um, of, of habitat, whether it's, um, you know, near a marsh or, you know, more in the open water and different types of gear and different types of bird species. If across the spectrum, we're seeing zip ties don't work, then next year, maybe we won't have that as an option because we have some data showing that it, they're just not effective. But right now where we're kind of starting from ground zero, we're allowing growers to try whatever they think might be effective. And then we, you know, we're evaluating it as we go along. We, I realize I, ideally we'll kind of hone in on something that's both effective and, you know, not cost prohibitive for industry. Um, uh, Cause I know these, these mandates come with a cost and it's, it's, uh, as, as Jeff said, we're, we're kind of depending on industry to innovate, right? And kind of, kind of hone in on what's working and um, what will be most cost effective. But um, we, we're having conversations, we're having conversations with, um, you know, cooperative extension. Um, Pete, Pete was very proactive. Pete, if you don't mind me mentioning this, but you reached out to, um, you know, a bird ecologist as a consultant. So I know that it's being taken seriously um, but we're just at a point where there, we don't have a whole lot of data. We are, you know, communicating with other states that are going through this as well and have maybe a little further along, like New York. New York has had closures specifically for birds on floating gear. So we are communicating with other agency heads and, um, you know, trying to, uh, trying to be compliant with the model ordinance requirements and minimizing the bur you know the, the immediate burden on industry as much as we can by giving giving the giving industry the option to just try what you think might be effective right now so um, let me clarify my question um, simplistically so basically we're all out there this summer growing oysters and some people get the birds off and some don't. We all get shut down. I've got um, five employees plus my wife and I. So that's seven people making a year round living. Um, so it's hard for me to go to the, the employees and say, we can't make money anymore because they all got to pay rent and buy food. And if the simple answer would be that the people that, and I, I'm just, it's, it could not, it might not be the case, but I'm just showing out a scenario. The people that um, still got the birds, if you guys could come up with a, a plan to say, hey, just drop your bags down, because the guy next to you figured it out and while you try to figure it out, um, so that we all don't get shut down. I don't know if that's going to be the case. I'm just um, thinking it ahead of time mm -hmm. in case that happens. I, I appreciate that, Peter. Uh, uh, and, and it is, it's, it's good to think these through. Um, let's, uh, we have not, we haven't made that decision yet. We haven't uh, figured out if, uh, um, what we would recommend if we just say, gee, do what your neighbor is doing. Um, but we'll, yeah, let's, let's, um, let's keep in discussion about that. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that to our attention today. And, and uh, we definitely, it's something we need to grapple with. 
Yeah, I think uh, my son Jeff Workin wants to ask a question. Um, so let's say that you guys test an area and um, it's hot with the bird poop. Like, what's the range on that? How far away? What's the like buffer zone for air, air barn to be closed and, and not be closed? Do you have to be like a mile away? Is it right adjacent to it or? Um, I don't know if there's anything you guys can answer that question. Let, let, let me uh, let me make sure I understand your question. Is how far away is our monitoring station uh, located, and then well, how how uh, how big a closure zone would we have to have? Is that well, yeah. Like say you test a uh, part in the bay, like a mooring field, and it comes up hot, and my farm is a half mile away. What is the range where you're like the safety zone away from the area that's hot? So uh, hard to predict, you know, uh, make a, a hypothetical here, but we've been very uh, surgical in, in, in many of our closures. So um, uh, oftentimes we have uh, closures around a, a storm drain, which is maybe just a 50 foot radius. So uh, I think probably what we would do is try to collect multiple uh, uh, samples uh, around uh, 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 these these uh, potential sources. You know that the, if there's if there's one uh, one uh, lease that has uh, uh, birds on it, and I think we'd probably try to to document whether or not that's the uh, uh, the cause. It's really hard to show cause and effect with fecal coliform testing, but uh, I, I think we'd 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 be very proactive in this, and we'd try to be very surgical in our our closures and, and see what we can do. And, and we would be, we, we, we understand this. We would, we would jump on this. We would be out there and taking samples and, and trying to box in uh, where, where this source is coming from. Because maybe it's, it's not the birds uh, that are sitting on the gear. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's a storm drain. Maybe there's some rainfall effect we, we haven't accounted for. Uh, you know, perhaps it's a passing boat. So um, yeah, you can't assume anything. But we, it would, we also would be very proactive. Yes, and it would depend on how hot that that sample was. You know, we had if it's over, you know, thirty one is our standard. We call them col uh, colony forming units um, per one hundred mils. But um, that's the threshold, and if it's over that, it's considered high. So one high sample isn't necessarily gonna close you down. Generally with the, the rate that we sample, it takes three samples um, within 15 to 20 uh, sampling events to close you down. Um, so if we had a hot one, we would be communicating that, trying to figure out, okay, we've got a hot sample, try to figure out the source. If we're pretty convinced it's the birds, well, that's when we need to go to the growers. If we're seeing birds, we're like, look, this is what we have, one more and you're gonna get closed down. Like, then maybe, you know, before it gets to the point where we're getting, we're having to close down the area, then, you know, your neighbors may be more, more inclined to do what is going to be effective. Um, but again, one hot sample isn't necessarily going to take you down and it would depend on just how high. If it's really, really high, then it would require more water to dilute and it would be a bigger closure. If it's marginally high, and as Jeff said, we certainly, you know, could have a 50 square foot closure um, around the area that we think um, is the source. I guess that's what I meant. I'll rephrase it. I didn't know if you would close down the entire estuary if it came back high, or if you would just close down like a certain part of it. So you yeah, answered my question now. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next up we have um, Mark. Mark, you can unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for having this. Um, this has been very helpful and I appreciate some of the things that you've said, Chrissy, about the willingness to um, take a look at some of the sections of these, um, these farms and, and improving them next year. Um, I think that's going to be very helpful. You've already um, touched on a few of the ones that I had noticed. And 
I've got a few a few others I'd like to run by you if you've again willing to to do that now. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I guess part of it is a big picture issue. There's there's three sections of this form, and we have to sign it three times. And each time you sign it, there's a different sentence or paragraph that either says, you know, to the best of your ability or to the pains, penalties of perjury and, and somewhere in the middle. Is there any reason there's three separate sections other than they may have come in at different times? And, or, or is it, what is the background on, on needing to sign it three times? Why, why is there three different sections? I guess my first question. Well, they kind of are three different forms, but having said that, I can see um, not necessarily needing a separate signature on the supplemental renewal form. Um, essentially, this this was a package where we email, you know, we mailed you out the the different um, different forms that were required. So, the annual report technically isn't part of the renewal application. So the, the, the annual report is the standalone that, that um, you know, makes you comply with the annual reporting requirement on your propagation permit. So that's sort of a standalone. Um, but uh, again, Jared, I would have to defer to you. Um, you know, we have the main uh, application renewal form and then we have the supplementary. Do we need to ask for signatures on both? I'd have to look into that and and, and uh, come back with a clear clearer answer. I I can't speak to that at the moment. And, and and believe me, I'm not asking anybody to. These are just suggestions for you to consider between now and when you mail it out next year. Right, and I think because we sent it as a year. <laughs> it may be you know they think it's all you know the renewal, but this is you know we just you're required to, to submit an annual report. And we figured this guided report is an easy way to get everybody to comply with that requirement. Mm -hmm. Getting it all at the same time, and you know, nobody likes to fill out paperwork. Um, but if we can get it all done at the same time, submit everything, this way we're not waiting on an annual report to um, be able to uh, issue the, the, the new permit. Mm -hmm. It's all in one package. So I think maybe that some confusion is in that um, all of this is just the, the renewal application, but it isn't. It's it's just a package um, that's all put out with the renewal application. So it is a separate standalone um, document, the, uh, the uh, annual report. Actually, I didn't bring up also uh, that I meant to. There's so, you know, some of the redundancy, for example, in the, in the renewal part, the first part, the renewal application for 2021, we ask you to list the growers. Um, and then we ask you to list, uh, no, sorry, the, your employees. And then we ask you to list your employees again in the report. So the distinction there is you may not have the same set of employees for next year for 2021 that you had in 2020. So asking you in the annual report is asking for, you know, what employees did you have last year? And then in the renewal applications, what employees are you going to have this coming year? So it seems like, oh, why do I have to list these again? But, you know, that gives the opportunity if there are differences. Okay. And that might answer the, my next question then. Um, on page 2D, it, it um, lists the on the offsite overwintering locations. And then on page 4D, it's, it seems to be coming up again as either a question or maybe as you just described, it's, it's looking forward, not back. But again, it'd be nice if you didn't need to write it in the second time, just like you had on, on page two, you already had it there and you're given an opportunity to change it on the right side of the form. Is there a need to have that again on page 4D that it seems to be the exact same thing? Bear with me. I'm looking at it. Okay, thanks. Hey, Mark. It's Tom Shields. Hi, Tom. I, hi, Mark. I, I think the important thing here to distinguish is that we've sent out multiple forms that are required or requested to be submitted at different dates. And um, you don't necessarily have to fill it all and submit it all immediately. Um, each form has a different submission 
deadline. And uh, as Chrissy said earlier, one form, the application form might be different than the, um, the, re the annual report form. So that's, that's why there's differences in, in that regard. Right, so um, in terms of, so just, just to follow up on, on Tom's comment, um, the annual report is due by a certain deadline. If you are one of the growers that take your, all your gear out of the water um, in January and you don't put any of your gear back in the water, you don't do any work, you don't do any propagation aquaculture activities till say April, then you don't need to actually have your propagation permit issued by February. Um, if you're not actually doing any work that would require you to, you know, you, you know, need a propagation permit. So the, um, the annual report has a deadline. The propagation permit doesn't necessarily depending on when you're actually going to be working. Okay. Um, so 4D, um, it asks, so it's sort of asking supplemental information. Um, so what species will be overwintered and, you know, describe the overwintering method. Um, so it's kind of different information. It's supplemental information to um, asking the overwintering location um, in, in, on the um, page two. But again, um, there are some redundancies and th these can be refined and maybe this is an exercise, you know, that can be done with more um, uh, consultation next year. Yeah, again, I'm mainly focused on oysters and occasionally clams, but oysters were the only ones I was thinking of that were coming out of the water for overwintering, but I could be wrong. Um, and another uh, suggestion or, or question, you, you already brought up the employees and in in versus the volunteer, mm -hmm. um, but there's also, you know, the term employee sometimes comes up as, as having certain connotations when it comes to um, their status, um, whether they're getting a 1099 form or um, they're a, a real full-time employee as opposed to a, um, a sh very short-term contract operate, uh, contractor, uh, independent contractor that might be helping you for a week or two or something like that. Is there any other term you could add in there, such as helper or contractor or something like that, so that there, there are others other than just um, volunteers? And I'm also thinking in the past, um, my kids were oftentimes helping, but not necessarily being employees. And they probably wouldn't think of it as volunteer. It'd be more like indentured servant, perhaps. I don't know. Sure, a lot of workers, employees slash workers who would be carrying product off site. Yep. I mean, that's the distinction is, is you know, if, there, if there's anybody that's going to have your product and be carrying it off site for whatever reason, off site calling, overwintering, taking it to the market. So another reason we're asking that is again, in the CARES Act, um, some, some people, some growers had their employees land for them under their employees' personal commercial permit. Mm -hmm. So then it became, it, it became tricky to try to tease out what, um, what product was aquaculturally reared and what value in that product needed to be assigned to the grower under the aquaculture sector and what product needed to be assigned to individual as commercial wild harvest because you know it was, it was kind of a tangled web and by having asking these questions we can refer to the paperwork and say okay well this person is an employee here so there's a chance that this could actually be aquacultured product instead of um, wild product because there are mistakes that are made and so this mm -hmm. is a lot of these are to help us tease out some of these things that became problematic in administering the cares act Yep. And also, again, the, the, you know, listing the employees that actually land and move product makes it easier to, you know, if they get stopped by an EPO to know that, yeah, they should, in fact, they are allowed to have and authorized to have this product offsite. Um, so, yeah, in terms of employee, we can certainly use different language, employee slash worker or. That, that would help. Helper yeah. even, uh, but the, as long as this distinction is they have product off your site 
without you present. Yep. Uh, just a couple of others. One, um, the, the term, there's a, it's a question that's been there forever, but um, unfortunately, different people have different understandings of the meaning. And that is on page seven, this on bottom versus off bottom. And I know I, I did um, put in a call to Gabe and we talked and we both have the same kind of uh, opinion of what it means. But unfortunately, if you go out on the web and look at some of the, the training um, that some universities have in New England, as well as some of the other training that's out there on what off bottom is versus on bottom, you might wanna clarify it a little bit um, on, on what you're looking for. I know you're, you're, it's very important to figure out what's floating gear versus not, but if there's a, something that could be done to make it clearer for folks, what is meant by on bottom versus off? Because unfortunately there are diff different views. And I know over the years I've, I've checked the box differently based on the last thing that I heard from somebody that was conducting some training or giving a talk on on bottom uh, versus off bottom. Okay. A great suggestion. Um, and last but probably least is um, just like you did for the some of the bird prevention gear for what, or however it's properly termed, having a checklist maybe that you would check off like on page seven when you're asking about gear, make it easy to just check the box on if you're talking about you know rack and bag versus trays and cages or whatever. Um, and then obviously have a place for other to, to add to it. Okay. And that is it, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for the, for the suggestions. Okay, next up we have Tara or Tara. You can unmute yourself. Hi, I just wanted to ask the question, it seems like you know, the bird deterrents are, you know, since it's a, a new um, procedure that's going to be required and it seems like, you know, it's definitely a public health issue. If you were aware of any grants that would be available to the growers um, to make it less pro uh, cost prohibitive to kind of help with some of these um, ideas that, you know, everyone's going to be trying out. I'm not aware of any um, exact grant opportunities right now, but I know um, Josh Reitzmach said that uh, this is being put forward to see grant, that this is a high priority um, thing for industry. So um, he, it looked, there are attempts to get programs um, putting money toward this. Although I, I can't point you in the direction of one at the moment, we are having these conversations and pointing to the building this is placing on industry. So hopefully in the near future, you know, we can we can share these opportunities. Chrissy, I, I actually have Josh, he's an attendee. Josh, I allowed you to speak, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up to what Chrissy said. Yeah, we're, we're trying to get some sort of like mini grant funds in order for, for this year to do what Chrissy just said to, you know, let growers try out methods and learn what does and doesn't work in different environments and with different gear types. So um, yeah, more to come on that hopefully very soon, but yeah, there's, there's efforts underway to, to provide some mini grants for, for that sort of purpose. That was provided for the ice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We've got a prohibitive cost. Involved. This is Jeff is, uh, Based on the is this a question for uh, ag for Sean Bowen? You know, it just seems like that would be up there, uh, their alley. So yeah, the CMAC funding would come through ag. And then I think once folks learn a little bit more about what works and what doesn't, then there's opportunity to, to really expand sort of grant funding opportunities through, through ag or through somebody else. Can you say? Thanks, uh, another opportunity might be to reach out to Bob Rowe, uh, president of the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association. Um, to see what, what opportunities he think might be available. Okay. Question, Tara? Um, can you still hear me? Yep. 
Um, yeah, we were just wondering, you know, it seems like it could be very cost prohibitive to, to even experiment depending on the size of your farm. So I was just, you know, <laughs> wondering what you do. Right. And I, I was actually, so Pete and I were talking about this earlier also that maybe we can put this problem. So here in New Bedford, we share a building with the University of Massachusetts School for Marine Science and Technology. And you know, this can be a problem even like maybe we can get a student to tackle where there are expanded funding opportunities for students. So if we could tie that into maybe a master's thesis. Um, we are looking into those opportunities. Okay, great. Definitely, I'm um, you know, happy to volunteer our farm for any project like that. <laughs> no, thanks. Okay, I have, I see Peter has his hand raised again, but I'm gonna go to Stephen Wright first, and then we'll go back to Peter. Stephen, you can unmute yourself. All right, um, thank you for holding this session. I appreciate it very much. And um, similar to uh, Mark Begley's point on some of the redundancies, I, I would just had a, um, a comment similar to what is checked off on the um, back page of renewal application where you, you have pre-filled, um, you know, what our, what our history has been for grow out and offsite calling, et cetera. If that would also be applicable to check off a box of um, on the questions on the supplemental or the the supplemental renewal form if there's no change from the prior year. Okay, so so give the opportunity to fill it in, but if it's identical, have a checkbox saying if no change, check here. Yeah, you know, just okay. keep it. You know, if that's a capability. Um, one other thing I wanted to say about the bird deterrent is, are there any methods that are frowned upon? At this point, not that I know of. I mean, obviously there are sort of NIMBY issues that might be frowned upon if you, you by your neighbor, by your, your, your upland neighbor. But um, at this point, um, it's open to try anything. We suspect that zip ties aren't going to be that effective. Yeah. Um, are, are there considerations for navigational uh, purposes? You know, in and around floating gear, there's ground tackle and lines and obviously the, well, the floating gear itself. Are, are, is there room for other apparatus that um, would fit into the array that may not, um, you know, be you know, there might be some gray area about navig navigational purposes in that capacity. I'm not aware of, of any right now. As, as we said, it, it's, we're, we're relatively new here in, in trying to navigate this, this mandate. And, um, you know, maybe we should be having these conversations, Tom and, and Jeff, with some harbor masters and, you know, or the, the Coast Guard saying, okay, you know, this is, a requirement on the growers now, or are there any, you know, real glaring no-nos? Um, we should probably have that conversation. So uh, that's a good point to bring up. It, it, it's a good question. Um, we haven't uh, looked into that, and that's probably something to uh, bring up with the harbor masters. Okay. Well, I, I've had a system in place for a number of years that seems to be pretty effective, and never had any issue with it from. Um, um, you know, navigational standpoint or harbor master, but, um, you know, was a little reluctant to share it on the, on the renewal form in case it, you know, came under scrutiny as to, you know, exactly how it works is all. So. Yeah. I, I think Christy's right. I think uh, there, there may be NIMBY in there as you have, you put something up and it's highly effective and, and it looks like Coney Island. Uh, your neighbors may, may complain. So. But sure. We'll have to deal with it. All right. Well, I thank you. Okay. Next up, we have Peter. Peter, you can unmute yourself. <clears throat> I had a question about the uh, employees. Um, so prior, everybody had the um, duplicate transaction cards 
Um, and now, if my understanding is right, you want to add their names to the uh, propagation permits. So will that be, they have to have their names on the propagation permits and the um, dual transaction cards? Yes, so the name on the propagation permit doesn't give them, you know, the, the uh, doesn't allow them to, to land product for you. That needs to be some kind of commercial card or employee transaction card connected to your commercial card. Um, but basically it, the propagation permit, um, the names of your employees or workers or helpers on the propagation permit will basically tell anybody, you know, any authority, EPO, that that person is authorized to have, you know, for example, seed, undersized product in their possession because they're transporting it for you. Um, we, we also put in the application that we'd like to see anybody who's landing product for you actually have an employee transaction card. Because as I said, we saw several instances where um, employees were landing for their grower employer um, under their personal commercial card. Um, so though in our um, system, those landings get attributed to the employee and not to the aquaculture business. So um, we still would like for all employees who are gonna be landing your product for your business to have an employee transaction card linked to your commercial permit. Um, no, Did I not, not answer your question? <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry. No, no, you answered it too well. So it's almost like having two driver's licenses. It just, um, I, you know, it, 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 it's a it's a slippery slippery big brother slope from my end, um, you know, to have everybody in a system um, so they can handle seed, and then in another system so they can handle um, large animals or market based animals. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like, I don't know if it's the, uh, the EPO or where it's all coming from, but it, like I say, from, from where I look at, and I, I guess I'm just being a pain in the neck, but you know, it's kind of like having two driver's licenses. It's it kind of is, Pete, but there's a re also a reason for it. Um, we had an issue this past summer, for example, with a grower who um, was violating Vibrio control measures. This grower ended up getting stripped of the license. And um, you could have employees that never land for you. So, so you can have employees or workers on, on, your, on your site and they never take product to market for you, but they might be moving product, they're culling. And um, in this case, this particular, you know, if somebody's been over and over again violating some of the regs, especially the public health regs. They're there for a reason. Um, and then they try to go get a job on somebody else's grant site. We kind of have a problem with that. They've shown a history now of skirting, skirting the public health regulations and now they're going to try to go get, um, you know, be able to move product off site for somebody else's grant. If they're on site and the product's not moving, okay, you know, we're not going to tell you you can't hire that person, but we would rather that person not be transporting product now, off site culling and, you know, not following the rules on your site. So, you know, I guess there is a little bit of Big Brother there in that aspect because um, it, we, we'd like to be able to have a handle on that because there, there were some egregious things going on in this particular case. So this, this grower didn't know any of this. And if, um, you know, we weren't asking, you know, who are you going to have working with you? This grower that was going to be hiring this person wouldn't have known. And we wouldn't have known. So it, it was, you know, opening the gate for, for more violations. So, so you're right, it is a little bit of big brother there, but there's a reason for it. Um, and also like new businesses, for example, where you're just starting up, you could have somebody working you f for you for 
a year, even two years before you ever land at any product. So there is a little bit of a decoupling there in the propagation permit and the commercial permit and, and having, um, having them listed. And you know, we, really there's, there's no extra money, that, you know, there, there's no extra fees in either case. So there's no extra fee to have employee transaction cards and there's no extra fee to have people listed on, the, um, on your propagation permit. So, um, you know, that hopefully, you know, there, there isn't the financial burden there. And um, I don't know, I, I, I kind of see where you get, where there's the big brother aspect of it. Um, but there also, there, there is a specific reason for, for us doing this. Um, I don't know, did you want to comment on my response? <laughs> yeah, uh, my, my comment would be, I'll stop causing trouble now and let somebody mm -hmm. else ask you some questions. Peter, we can't really hear you that well. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm new with this. So okay. my, co my, my comment, uh, is I'll stop causing trouble and let somebody else ask a question. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm not seeing anybody else's hand raised in the queue. Um, so at this time, I'll ask if anybody has any final questions. Um, again, the raise hand function is in the participants box. Usually it's in a toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Oh, uh, I have Scott Soares. Scott, you can unmute yourself. Thanks, Julia. No, not a question. Just a thank you to you all for uh, for putting this together. I know uh, it, it adds uh, work on top of everything you, you guys are already having to do. And I uh, just, again, want to echo you know, the, the thanks that you've already heard from some of the folks in the call. So thanks so much for doing this. And when you finish up with the recording, if you could send that out, uh, we can we can amplify that and get that out to any folks who weren't able to, to sit in on this meeting. So thank you very much. Well, we will likely link it to our YouTube page and send a link around as the recording's probably going to be a pretty large file. Great. Thanks a lot, Jared. Well, thank you all. I appreciate all the feedback. Um, you know, as you know, I took over for Chris in March. I, my first day um, was March 16th, and I was told don't show up to work because the, the COVID bomb hit. Um, so, you know, I have a lot to learn still. And, you know, Pete, I, we've had a lot of conversations, right? And I, as I said, I value these conversations because I still have a lot to learn and trying to understand, you know, how industry is impacted by some of these mandates is important to me and important to the division. So, um, you know, these lines of communications are important and I know you're gonna have to, you know, there may be, you may have a question that you're asking me and I, I don't understand it. So, um, you know, it, I still have a lot to learn as well, you know. So um, hopefully we can work through this together. Um, and uh, in terms of improvements for the application next year, the renewal application, there are so many great um, recommendations that we will implement. Uh, so if everybody's all set and there are no more questions, I would say have a good night. Thank you so much. Thanks for all your questions. Much appreciated.